right? Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much for showing up, everyone. Hey, welcome to Coinbase. You're doing great. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Uh, welcome to Coinbase. Um, we're excited to have, be hosting the Infrastructure as Code meetup uh, this week or this month. And uh, first, I just want to introduce Chris McHugh, uh, who runs this meetup. I have a few words from him. So, uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you to Coinbase for hosting. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are around for the next talk, so if something today sparks your interest, or somebody you tell somebody something interesting they'd like to hear about it, let me know. Um, we're definitely looking for some more talks for interesting topics. Thanks. It really was that easy. I just started talking to him, and here we are now. So. Uh, First up, uh, well, sorry, my name's Shane. Uh, I work on the infrastructure team here in Coinbase, and I'm really excited to be introducing two of our t two of my teammates that I get to work closely with day to day, uh, Luke Demai and Grant Jensen. First up is going to be Luke talking about infrastructure as code and our open source project GeoEngineer. We use that to codify our infrastructure and do some really neat things, which he'll elaborate on. So everyone, give it up for Luke. Thanks, Shane. All right, so uh, to get started, um, just want to say hi. Um, how many people here are from the infrastructure meetup group? Cool, so like half the room? Yeah, cool. So uh, this talk, um, as Shane introduced, I'm part of the infrastructure team here at Coinbase. Um, our goal as a team, I'll get into in a little bit, but I, I wanted this presentation to be kind of just walking everybody through some of the decisions we made in codifying our infrastructure. We recently took a fresh look at it um, last summer, and going forward, um, we chose some custom tools. I kind of wanted to explain the rationale behind that, um, what we did to get ourselves there, and what we're doing now to keep ourselves there. So um, to get started, I just wanted, I'm sure people are familiar with Coinbase, but I just want to give a quick overview. We're a digital currency company. We're one of the leading companies in the space. Um, we have a few major products. Um, the most popular one is Coinbase.com. If you want to buy cryptocurrency, you go there. You can buy Ethereum, Bitcoin, Litecoin. And we have another product called GDAX, which is an exchange. You can um, trade around between those currencies and maybe some fiat currencies. And we also provide uh, merchant tools for, you know, if you wanted to buy, theoretically, if you start a coffee stand, we could let you um, buy, like, like sell cups of coffee with Bitcoin. Um, this is the price of Bitcoin. It's probably not completely up to date, but um, basically, yeah, as it says below, we store 10% of all the Bitcoin in circulation. So currently the quote market cap for Bitcoin is $30 billion. And you know, you can do the math, that's $3 billion of essentially digital cash that is kind of under our stewardship. And I think it's good to frame the talk in this way that these are some of the challenges we face day to day or the realities we face in some of the decisions we make. So with further ado, um, just a little context. Um, we, long, long time ago, were just a silly Heroku company um, with one server serving out a bunch of Bitcoin in the unregulated world of crypto. Um, we obviously quickly outgrew that, and we expanded out into AWS. We are a primarily solely AWS company. Um, and as we migrated away from Heroku, um, the first thought, and I think what a lot of people thought back when we were making this transition, was cloud formation everything. Um, all of our resources were in cloud formation, and we quickly ran into limitations of cloud formation, which I'll get into in one second. Um, and to get around those limitations, we started to explore tools like Terraform. Um, Terraform allowed us to have a good have good visibility into what we were doing, and um, you know use the coolest, newest tools. Um, however, as we began to see the limitations of Terraform, um, we turned to an internally developed tool by Graham Jensen, um, the creator, uh, and he created that uh, to solve potentially some of the issues with Terraform. Um, the logo there I just made up an hour ago. I'm sorry, Graham. <laughs> I use it all. I use it all over the place now. Okay, so just <laughs> just to give an overview of GeoEngineer. Um, first of all, it's an open source project. You can go to GitHub.com/Coinbase GeoEngineer, and it's all there. 
use it today. Um, and you know the the key line is it's a Ruby DSL that you know allows you to codify, plan, and execute changes to cloud resources. Um, some of the key Terraform features, if we had to like really like shortly explain it, is uh, it wraps Terraform essentially. Um, there's no state files or you know state at all, other than what actually exists inside your cloud. And I'm going to use the word your cloud today. I hope nobody minds. Rather than I, I couldn't think of anything better. Um, it's a Ruby DSL, meaning pretty much everything you do is Ruby. So you can you know, uh, have conditionals, loops, um, anything you like in Ruby. Uh, it allows custom validations. So we'll get into that in a little bit. And it allows you to build expressive templates aside from Terraform modules. So I want to start with this, the list from Benson's presentation. But you know, this is a good way to frame what we're doing here with the, you know, the projects we're taking on, is that we have this philosophy that as an infrastructure team, we provide self-service tooling to empower engineers to rapidly build, ship, and operate services with low risk. Um, and as we chose what tool we wanted to use inside of our infrastructure, this is kind of what we use to frame that discussion. So I want to start with self-service. Um, when Coinbase, we have this attitude of self-service. I was talking at the lunch table about this. We like this idea of if you're on a team and you're responsible for building out a new service internally, um, we are really focused on providing you the tools to do that without having to come to Infra and ask us, hey, can you give me an ELB? Hey, can you launch an RDS instance? Um, and through self-service, we allow that to happen. So the, the equivalent to that might be you know, in Terraform, you're just creating those resources. Um, let's dive in. CloudFormation. How many people here have used CloudFormation? on a really serious basis. Okay. On a serious basis. <laughs> I mean, okay. What was your experience with CloudFormation? Uh, so far, we use it for, uh, I think we were using it to um, replace, try to replace one of our um, internally developed uh, container orchestrators. But it, it actually was really, really limiting as it really just sort of, well, here's a, here's a few auto scaling groups that you can play with. Okay. Uh, you, I mean, pretty much you still have to pro project ahead what your needs are. You can't just depend on cloud formation to right. roll out everything. Yeah, so this, I guess, helps. We didn't have a good experience with cloud formation for a couple reasons. Um, one, like with the vein of self service, um, it was difficult to allow people to make changes in cloud formation. There was no way to let somebody make a change to our cloud formation templates and then show them what was going to happen. Um, we just kind of had to take their word that these you know, changes you just made are going to be applied to our um, Amazon account and that everything's going to be fine. This is just a random screenshot I found on the internet. I, I'm, for all I know, this is from Amazon. And you can see like <laughs> this ridiculous workflow here where you have like a create fail. And you don't know what's going on. It's like, uh, uh, USA 1A parameter is not working. And you know, then you try it again, and oh, it works, then it fails again. And that was pretty much our experience. Whenever you went to modify anything, you're running into these issues. Um, we had codified a significant amount of all of our IAM, so like permissioning, users, policies, groups, and our network infrastructure, like our VPCs, our uh, subnets, route tables, so on, with cloud formation leading up to this. However, um, Terraform was what we ended up codifying a lot of our projects. In. So like Coinbase.com, where are those ELBs living? Like how do we update them? So just to give, I guess, to ask the same question, how many people here have used Terraform? Cool, so the majority of the room, cool. And how many of you guys feel like you have a good understanding of how like state works in the context? Okay, cool. So, um, this is a quick refresher for everyone else. Um, when you run a Terraform plan, you're essentially running two commands. You're running a Terraform refresh and a Terraform plan. The Terraform refresh is basically taking what is in this state file, which is supposed to be all of the resources you've defined in your config um, and what they actually look like in you know, your cloud. Um, and it updates that based on um, comparing the IDs and the resources in that TF state with your cloud. 
Uh, from there, you have a Terraform state file, which Terraform compares to um, your actual Terraform config, and you get a diff. Using that diff, you're able to Terraform apply, um, which basically does the whole process again and applies that to your actual infrastructure and makes those changes. Um, in the context of self-service, this is something else we ran into that was an issue. Um, as you, back when we were really heavily into this, Terraform state was, we felt a mess. Um, different, difficult to coordinate, I mean, this is a well-known problem. Um, we weren't really feeling like buying into remote state yet, and we didn't know how to like, you know, coordinate. And you know, generally, it was something we were trying to explore, is there a way around this? So this didn't exist, what I'm about to show you here, um, but HashiCorp recently posted this. It is a, um, it's the reason why state needs to exist. Um, and it's because you need to be able to map your Terraform config to the real world. And Terraform state is that bridge. They have other reasons on there like performance, but really this is the limiting factor. Um, and if you look at this, um, you can see that they basically say for some providers like AWS, Terraform could theoretically you know, use something like AWS tags. Um, and they even say that early prototypes um, were designed around that. And they say they ran into problems and that not all resources support tags and not all cloud providers support tags. We just, uh, basically, the, the, the challenge is there now. Can we do this without state? And that's essentially what we set out to do, or just when he initially built the tool, set out to do. And while not all resources support tags, like, you know, for example, IAM users don't support tags. Security groups, believe it or not, don't support tags. Um, but they have a name. They have a unique identifier, essentially, that you can access with the AWS API. And basically, we set out to build GeoEngineer with this model. So rather than you know, looking at the Terraform model than looking at this, rather than comparing um, TF state to your Terraform config and then using that to apply to your cloud, you can just use GeoEngineer to compare what your state looks like in comparison to what resources actually exist in your cloud. And using this, you're able to get by without state. Um, there are obviously sacrifices you make. Um, for one, I don't know this would work in Google. <laughs> uh, we haven't tried it, um, but it does work in AWS. Um, for the most part, every resource works, except for Elastic IPs, which I can talk to you after if you want. <laughs> But for the most part, we're able to successfully codify every resource that we have at Coinbase um, without state files. Cool. So here's a quick look at what GeoEngineer actually looks like compared to Terraform. Um, as you can see, they're extremely similar. Um, it's designed to provide the same interface to the user. If you're looking at the Terraform documentation, um, you're not really going to have trouble converting that to GeoEngineer. Um, but there are some significant changes, um, which I will kind of show you real quick. Um, for one, you can see that this is definitively Ruby over here. Um, and, you know, this is a sub object on a project. Um, and this project is something that is built into GeoEngineer, this idea that resources are part of a larger project. And you know, the idea might be that you have a project where you define you know, specifically this metadata about all the resources to come after it. So you have this idea that you know, we have these tags that are gonna be set on every single resource. Um, we want to make sure we monitor all of these resources because they're important, let's say. Another cool thing you can kind of see on here is that we have these convenience functions that you're able to add. The idea of like SSH ingress for Bastion. Um, and what that basically means is, in theory, we could also have a rule saying, you know, 553 UDP ingress. You guys can leave. You, can, you just leave any time. <laughs> um, and, you know, you could add these convenience functions. So, you know, this kind of falls into that self-service idea of, you know, we want people to feel comfortable with this. We want them to have somewhere to go to look. But we also um, want to give them these options to make things more convenient. So they don't have to worry about making sure all the hosts 
uh, or all the resources they define in our project are actually tagged correctly because you know that's defined at a top level. Um, that we have these automatic little convenience wrappers that people can use. Like I want to make sure I can get to it from the bastion. Cool. So moving on, like for philosophy a little bit more. Um, one of the other things that's important is this concept of low risk. Um, as I said before, there's like three billion dollars we steward now. I haven't seen any of that, but it's there somewhere. And uh, one of the key, actually, probably the primary reason when we had this major evaluation between GeoEngineer uh, and Terraform this summer was that we wanted a way to be able to take a configuration. So let's say an engineer comes to us and says, "Hey, I want to launch this new service. I need, you know." RDS, I need Elastic Cache, and I need like all these crazy security groups, and I need to be able to deploy in to all these different places. We're like, okay, you know, you can test that and run it against these validations that we've already built. So this is a really simple validation, but when you run a plan against a set of geoengineer resources, uh, it, it performs these validations. Like these are really simple here, but you can kind of see the power it potentially gives you. It's this idea that you can say, does it have the name tag? Does it have the project name tag? And then you can perform this little helper function here. Like, is the project name correct? And you can actually dig in and find <clears throat> metadata that makes sense. Like, the project name should equal the project's full name. Um, and it, you can extend this to a bunch of different you know, aspects of your infrastructure, like no opening security groups to more than like you know one IP address at a time, or only like never opening up access to the wide internet for public services. And this has allowed us to easily extend this to everyone in the company, even the interns who just ran away. They can, they're able to easily propose um, any change they want to our infrastructure with kind of these guidelines here that allow them to not really have to put too much thought into how does AWS work in at Coinbase. Um, they just kind of have it available. And that doesn't exist in terms of, unfortunately. Um, we actually went pretty far down this rabbit hole to try to potentially build out custom validations in Terraform. Unfortunately, it's just not really possible without diving into some crazy go shit that I don't think anybody wanted to do at the time. Um, Another thing is templates. So everybody's familiar, probably who's worked with Terraform is a concept of a module. Um, modules, I, I don't know if anybody, does anybody want to talk about experiences with modules? Anybody feel comfortable? What was your experience with modules? They were great. Okay. Yeah, we, didn't, we haven't had many problems with them. Yeah, so modules, so in, in our experience, modules allow you the flexibility to do a lot. Um, they're not, um, perfectly flexible, so you can't, you know, there's obviously no loops inside of, you, know, you have counts basically you're working off of, yeah, there's like a different way to do things. Um, and you look at these two, so these are like exactly the same between this geoengineer and Terraform um, module versus template. Um, geoengineer essentially is just, it's a Ruby method and it has you, know, you pass in these different parameters and you're creating these resources using you know, traditional Ruby um, uh, you know, techniques. Like you just, you know, for every sitter block, you know, you're creating a uh, different security group or, you know, however you may do it. Um, but you can see this one like cool distinction is you can say like, if the interface type is a virtual gateway, go down this code path versus when you have Terraform, uh, we had to actually create separate, and this is from like the actual um, we, we competed against each other <laughs> to see who could build a better version, Terraform versus Geoengineer. And the issue we had was that we weren't able to come up with a way to fully come up with generic um, uh, like, like templates. So if you wanted a virtual gateway route versus a, I think it was a VPN or something, it, you had to have separate modules. That being said, I don't view this as a reason why or why not to use Geoengineer versus Terraform. I think they both accomplish the same things. I just wanted to point out that Geoengineer does have the ability to um, create templates, um, which are equivalent to the Terraform module. So <laughs> we, we chose Geoengineer, as you can obviously tell I was leaning towards, or we've, <laughs> we, we chose Geoengineer. And 
the reason we chose GeoEngineer was part because we didn't think Terraform was quite where we wanted it for our specific purposes. Um, but also because it gave us some flexibility with validations and it gave us some flexibility with um, self-service tools we were trying to build um, to potentially, and also the uh, opportunity to try something potentially new. So now we have decided on our you know, champion for the time being, and we have to consolidate these codified resources that have been codified through uh, CloudFormation, Terraform, and GeoEngineer up until this point. So we needed a way to tackle that. So you remember I told you GeoEngineer essentially doesn't have this concept of state. It goes directly to your cloud and determines you know, what resources exist there versus what exists in its configuration file and is able to provide you the traditional Terraform um, conveniences. So one of the things GeoEngineer is able to do is uh, produce this output here, this command geostatus. Geostatus essentially is a command that returns to you the number of codified resources in your infrastructure, the number of uncodified resources in your infrastructure, the percentage, and the total, like the, the specific resources that are not codified. Um, you can also run without dash dash quiet, and it'll just return every single resource, like with a separate, um, uh, separate um, uh, arrays there for or just separate hashes for uh, uncodified versus codified. Um, so using this, we had to start tackling the project of consolidating. So this is our metric we used. So knowing that geoengineers start around like 50% of our resources, we were able to basically turn this geo status onto our infrastructure and run it on like an hour loop and just post it back to our logging pipeline. This is obviously Kibana and build out exactly the code, you know, the, the level of codification in our infrastructure for any point in time. So you can see, you know, this is us battling up over the course of maybe like two months to get all the way to 100% of our infrastructure being codified using one single tool. Um, having this metric and having this obviously available to us is good for a couple reasons. One, uh, we are, we're able to coordinate really easily. Everybody had the ability to run geo status and see what needed to be converted left. So it was like, all right, gotta take my Terraform config and modify it or like, you know, sort through this uh, cloud formation, which nobody wanted to do. Um, and, you know, we were able to work as a team towards getting to the end uh, you know, the, the, the top of that, uh, that little, you know, mountain. Cool, so now we're up there. I guess the real challenge we've felt as a team is how do we keep our percentage high? So this is a screenshot I took today. We're at 99.7. I figured it had to be high to be able to justify even coming up here. But the you can see that, like, in the past, we've actually been low. And the reason for that is because we do provide access to certain teams to modify certain resources um, in AWS based on just you know IAM um, permissions, and people modify resources live in production, no matter how hard we try. And this has been something we've been battling. Um, additionally, people create resources um, without, especially in development, without going through the traditional pipelines. So we've been working to come up with ways to prevent this from happening, and. and work everyone in through our, our, our codification pipeline. So one of the ways we've done that is with our Mars bot. Um, Mars is essentially a tiny little Sinatra service that accepts webhooks from GitHub. So when a new pull request is created on a geo-supported service, it responds by running that pull request um, commit again, you know, using geoengineer and producing a plan, which is then posted out as a comment. Um, this is helpful because it helps people understand, even if you don't have you know, geoengineer set up on your laptop or, you know, maybe you just are trying to push through a quick commit and you don't want to have to figure out how to use geo, you can quickly take one of our available templates to create, you know, the service, the um, services required for your new service and just pull request it up. We're able to quickly review it and apply it. This has helped speed up 
the iterations this has helped improve the iteration space so that people are more willing to come to us and propose resources without us having to kind of track people down. So I have this little thing I've been calling Trojan Mars. And it's this idea that when Mars runs, we actually post out a bunch of information every time to Elasticsearch. Uh, you just store a normal logging pipeline. And what we're able to do is create Elasticsearch based on the status of our codification at any point in time. So the beauty of this is we can just fire off Elasticsearch. So a couple we've been getting annoyed with recently are this one here, like codification percent below 98. That means somebody's been creating resources in dev without going through the pipeline, or maybe um, something changed in the config, something's off, we know immediately. This is just running master plan, what actually comes up. And then this other one here is saying, okay, maybe there's resources that are actually codified, but how are they actually, like, did somebody modify one little line in it and change like a security group? that will fire. So that's if, if the plan returns without um, the resources actually being in sync. And this is more important because in theory, if somebody's in your Amazon account with potentially permissions and starts changing things in production, you want to know immediately. And uh, this has helped us, you know, stop people from these bad behaviors. Cool. This is the last slide. Um, I just wanted to bring this one up. Um, this is another key metric we use in terms of, as an infrastructure team, how we conduct ourselves. And it's the human versus computer metric. So we put all of our IAM um, events into our logging pipeline, and we're able to determine you know, what actions inside of our infrastructure are um, done by either a computer, which would be Terraform plus Geo, or you know, a human, so somebody logging in. So this combined with those other metrics about our codification percentage are very important aspects of our, um, our KPIs as a team that we use to influence the work we're going to be doing going forward and building out things like those last alerts and um, generally improving our tools and helping streamline like what we're actually providing to developers so that they have um, an incentive to use our tooling and um, Yes, yeah, stay within those, quote, guardrails that we're trying to provide. Anyway, that's it. Any questions? Cool. So, is it typical workflow for... Just we're recording it so we can catch it. Is the typical workflow for removing resources to, uh, like, delete them from the geo, from the geo code, and then, like, see what it says is now uncodified, and then go in and manually delete those? Yep, it's pretty bad. Okay, I mean, it's 100% codified. It is, so if without that ability to keep track of that metric, that was the way we were falling the most, is because of the lack of state file, you're not able to see when resources are removed, but you are able to see through them not being codified. Uh, this works. Uh, the question I have right now is, uh, since you guys are not keeping state, uh, so let's just say, this, uh, Someone does a, a, a partial a partial deploy, and I, I, I'm guessing at some point you have, you would have to, and at some point you have to go back into some sort of cleanup because I mean that's some some of the issues I ran into is that some of the some of the deploys left resource basically left uh, uh, resources that that the dangling resources. What do you mean by dangling resources? Uh, a lot of times, like once I, um, well, the Elastic IP, some of the the plans I did left the uh, instances up and like I still had the instance and up and running. They weren't they weren't destroyed. They weren't destroyed once I wanted to pull the plan. Right. So if I'm hearing you right, I think the way it works is you know GeoEngineer would run again and it would see that those instances haven't been deleted and it would okay. just ask to delete them. Oh, okay. Or, or, yeah, so, yeah. so you essentially have all the plan. All the pl you would. Let's just say, if I deploy, I request these resources. I deploy it, and I ask for new resources. I no longer need the old resources. Do do I just? What do I do with the old resources? Are they just? Do they still exist, or do I? Uh, you would remove them from. This is obviously the one major weak point of not having state, is that you don't have a way. Just because you remove them from the state doesn't mean that. 
uh, geoengineer knows to remove them. Um, and if there was a slide that said next up, it would be a way to do that seamlessly. Okay. But, so since you can't sh share state, how do you keep track of other people's resources? What do you mean by other people's resources? So like if, you, if you're sharing state, you can export the state, and then I can just use the data to import their state, for example, like the VPC ID or something, and I never have to touch the VPC ID. Sure. Um, so the idea would be that because there's no state, GeoEngineer looks up to find the resources that exist inside of your uh, cloud, right, inside your AWS account. And so you, maybe you define the VPC, and you define that um, with a name. VPC is going to be tag, right? And <coughs> GeoEngineer will create the tag on that resource, and GeoEngineer will now intrinsically link those two resources. So you can, you can, you and I can both run by pulling a repository, um, GeoEngineer on the same repository on our laptops, and it would in no way, like there would be no sh state need to be shared because they're both looking at the same Amazon account. Determine those IDs and match them up with the names inside of the repository. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yeah, I might have missed it, but uh, how do you guys handle concurrency? So if I um, run Geo, um, Geo Engineer, and it checks the resource, actual resource state, mm -hmm. uh, out in the wild, whatever, um, and then it bases one of my changes on that, and then somebody else, um, let's say at an earlier time, just made a change to that resource, so they make it right after mine. Um, how do you guys handle like right reconciliation? Um, that this, the change, the state that I thought I had at the time that I ran Geo Engineer has changed out from under me. That's a good point. Um, there's no current locking on applies. Is that, I guess if, yeah, if that's the question you're asking. Yeah. Um, no, there's not. So that would be, generally I think the reason we don't run into that is because we have a limited number of people who can actually make the applies. Um, the idea is if you wanted to scale this, right, and have anybody in the company be able to apply, like let's say people were managing specifically their own resources and they needed to apply them um, and you had no idea who would be applying, yeah, you could run into some weird race conditions. Yeah. Okay. So, so you talked about the um, geoengineer can manage all of the resources that you guys um, currently use. Can you talk about what those are, or if like, is it most of them? Are there certain ones that you don't handle? Yep. So hold on. Okay. So. Hello. Yeah, so I can just show you in the repository what we have supported. But it was everything that we needed at that point in time. So, blah, blah, blah. oh, shoot. Am I not supposed to be doing this, Jason? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Geoengineer. <laughs> so, yeah, the, I can show you specifically what a resource looks like inside of Geoengineer. Okay. Um, so, here's the ones we currently support, which are all. Amazon resources. Um, so you see there's a decent amount of them. Um, working our way down. I mean, I, I, I could specifically go through a lot of them, but the basic idea is these resources are mapping what we consider to be the unique identifier in the configurations we generate with what we can identify from the Amazon API to link those two resources. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, I don't know, Jensen, do you know the exact number of how many we support? Uh, no, but we got ALBs today. We got ALBs today. That was a pretty big win. <laughs> yeah, adding them like all the time as we come across uh, resources that we want to actually support. Right. Um, and and we're, I mean, we're never going to be ahead of Terraform, but, but uh, we can kind of keep up pace with them because the, we're only wrapping their hard work. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to do actual hard work. Anything else? Have you, have you considered taking away the keys so there can't be manual changes, or is that too detrimental to your workflow? Taking away the what? The keys to do manual, like people making manual changes, um, or is that too, too what, what like, keys, like, the keys to have a limited? To, 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 so like rather than having people, you know, you have that percentage of like people um, doing manual changes versus going through Geo Engineer, or um, oh, so or that, you're using codified um, yeah. ways of making changes. What we're really trying to move towards 
is this concept of we have the Mars bot. We want to make an Earth bot, another planet we came up with. And it's basically going to ideally apply these plans for you. And that would be at the point where we just lock it down. Um, I think it's actually potentially a culture issue that we allow people to make changes. Um, and I think it's top of our mind. Um, I think we're on the infrastructure team. Part of the issue is I think a lot of the times changes are made. It's during a situation where it's hard to argue with someone. Like, we need to change the parameter group for a Postgres database, or we have a major problem. Mm -hmm. And yes, they could go into GeoEngineer, change it, submit it. Um, but they also, because of their role, have permissions to go do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a culture thing. It's also building GeoEngineer to be a little more streamlined, so people are more encouraged to do that. Thanks. Cool. Anything else? Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. And up next, we have Graham Jensen. The one, the only. Do you want to use this one or this one? So, uh, hey, my name is Graham Jensen. I'm the tech lead on infrastructure here. And today I'm just going to give a quick um, talk about CoFlow, which is our secure deploy pipeline. Um, the first thing I want to do is give a demo. So, exit out of the presentation I just got into. Um, so, this is CoFlow. Actually, this is an anonymized version of CoFlow because I didn't want the security team yelling at me. So, um, this is me deploying CodeFlow in development. CodeFlow is now deploying in development. <laughs> So what, um, so what I can do here is over here is then like search for our deploy test repo, which is the repository which we most thrash on here because that's how we test it. We can go in here, we can go to development. We can see that this here is actually just a Docker configuration file. Um, so this is all the configuration needed to deploy into uh, development. Uh, here's some environment variables. We can like go in and change those. Um, oh, some bad layouts going on. And here is the description of um, the AWS services that we're running. So let's just quickly change this to an M4 large. Save that. Go back here. And then deploy this deploy test. Ah, it takes a second. So, I just upgraded a um, change the number of uh, change the instance size of a running service inside um, using CodeFlow. Um, changed an environment variable and then deployed it. And as you can see, that took that was pretty quick. So um, I'm just going to go over some of the features of CodeFlow. Yeah. So again, uh, just echoing what. Uh, Luke stole with me. Um, uh, the infra team at Coinbase uh, provides uh, self-service tooling to empower engineers to rapidly build and ship and operate services with low risk. So CodeFlow's kind of two main uh, guiding principles of development was self-service and uh, low risk. So, you know, what is CodeFlow? Well, CodeFlow is just a self-service secure pipeline to move code um, to production. So that goes from GitHub into a Docker container into AWS, and then hopefully we make some Bitcoin. So um, here's some parts of the pipe that we're using that I'm just going to talk about today. So we've got GitHub, which is our main source control. It's on a um, uh, GitHub Enterprise account. Um, uh, Docker, which is uh, we use as the execution environment and configuration management for applications. We don't use it as security because there's a CBE every other day breaking it out, uh, people breaking out of Docker containers. Um, CodeFlow, which is part of CodeFlow, which is um, uh, just like the builder and config management and the user interface of um, uh, that we provide. Um, Odin, which is the actual deployer, which is the thing that um, deploys, um, which is basically creating and deleting AWS resources. Um, Heimdall, which is the part of the, the system which actually uh, reviews commits. 
and um, Celis and Clear, which are security scanners, which scan all um, every commit that goes through. Um, so the main security in inside of Coinbase that we use for just about everything is through consensus. Um, the main reason for that is it provides uh, uh, security against a lot of different types of attacks, as well as being really good for compliance and auditing and and just um, uh, general protection. So like the, the, the kind of every question that we ask ourselves with anything that gets into production is who changed what, what changed, and who reviewed the change. Um, so this kind of like protects us against like insider threats where we have a compromised employee, maybe a contractor comes in, we have to give them access or um, someone interviewing that is, is doing like a work trial. Um, and external threats like an employee's laptop is compromised, like we just went through an airport and the TSA plugged a USB stick in there and decided to compromise it on behalf of some other agency. Um, and uh, to give you an example of this, um, I'll talk about Shapeshift. So Shapeshift hired a DevOps um, a, a sysadmin, who then, um, over the course of about six months, modified the production environment to be able to steal a hot wallet, which contained about $100,000 worth of um, Bitcoin. Um, he then, after being fired and found out and leaving, and I think lives in Romania now, um, he then sold part of, um, he then sold access to a compromised laptop, which he was able to compromise with one of his colleagues, um, so that they can then compromise the hot wallet again. And that was after Shapeshift took a lot of action to prevent such a thing happening. Um, so I think all up about $200,000 worth of Bitcoin was stolen um, by just one person or essentially one malicious actor. So at Coinbase, we're really not liking that. <laughs> um, we really don't want to do that um, or allow that to happen. So we, we implement many security um, aspects. So why self-service? So why are we actually um, providing a self-service tool rather than just, I don't know, um, every single time someone needs to deploy, they come and ask us to deploy, it, to deploy for them? The main, the main reason is like developer productivity. We want people to be quickly developing and then putting code into production to test it and being able to roll back from production. The idea is that we want to, to, to be continually moving forward and we, we think that the, the, the time it takes for a person to get a piece of code into production is time that a security vulnerability could exist or time that a developer is waiting on something to occur or, um, or time that's essentially wasted. Um, we've got uh, another point of like making a self-service and like a particular pipeline is to focus the Infra team's effort to make one particular pipeline very secure and um, and 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 well trusted and completely automated, so that we um, don't have to maintain like 20 different ways of deploying different services. So we don't have to like memorize, you know, all oh, this deploy has like this particular way of going around it, or I have to kick that that EC2 instance particularly like this, or on like a Thursday to make it work. Like making sure that like all of those kind of um, uh, eccentricities are removed and we just have like one way of deploying makes it like a really nice um, uh, and great way for our team. So this is yeah what a deploy looks like, just like I showed you, just select a commit, you then click deploy and then it goes out and this bit here is sped up a bit. So it takes about like five minutes to deploy. Um, so what actually happened during that deploy? Well, what it did is it took the service config, which is the Docker config, it then mapped it to a, the AWS config, which is the description of um, the auto scaling groups, as well as um, um, as well as things like what ELB to attach it to, you know, the instance size, um, different health information, uh, different information about like health and de de desired capacity, as well as uh, we also support like auto scaling rules and um, uh, particular time. Uh, particular events at different times. And then what it does is it, is it deploys. So on the right hand side, you can see that this is a description of, of what's going to happen. We're going to launch five different M4 large boxes with one container on it, that'll be the web container. And we're gonna launch three different C4 boxes on it. Um, which are the worker, which are the worker boxes. Each one is running, like one's running a bin worker and the other one's running a cron. So th this, this particular thing here would, um, is how we describe services at, uh, in CodeFlow. So 
the production environment, um, so every single production environment change. So before I changed it in the development environment, if I was to change that in the production environment, I would need someone else here to give me a plus one. So the idea is that um, every change leaves an audit trail because we want to be able to see who did what in production um, um, so that we know if something goes wrong, we know what happened, we can ask, you know, like, why did you do that? Um, developers like like to control their environment as well. We don't. We want to give as much to the developers as possible so that they can control what instance they pick, they can control how many instances they pick. We don't want to be the one that sits there and goes, hey, you know, your, um, your website's like, like, like needs more instances. We want them to. We want to give them the tools. We want to give them the ability to un, uh, to understand what is actually needed to scale their own services. Um, and then, of course, we uh, also uh, implement restrictions on views of particularly sensitive information to like a, a list of people, so that we don't have to like um, well roll environment variables. And people from the security team here um, really don't like doing that. Um, so this is like uh, an example of uh, someone trying to change an environment variable in a, in, a uh, in production. So you'd click save and then you'd have to go over to pending change set and you'd click one, but of course you can't review your own commit because that would be pointless. Um, so, um, yep. So Heimdall is our bot that secures code. Um, it sees all git, git commits and then judges whether they're worthy or not. Um, it makes sure that it has enough reviews and it also looks at its parent to make sure it has enough reviews. And of course, that's a recursive um, statement. So what happens is we validate the entire Git branch before every deploy. We make sure that no commit was like, like, like um, uh, no one rewrote history to in inject some kind of bad commit and you know, like some reverse SSA shell or something bad. Um, we validate the change, not the commit, because validating the change that is applied to master has some really good benefits, meaning that like rebasing and merging don't actually um, affect the change that is about to be applied. So that's really good for developer happiness. They don't have to like keep getting um, keep getting um, uh, reviews for things that basically have been reviewed before. Um, we require MFA on every single um, review. Uh, this is because of a particular exercise where um, some OAuth creds were out there and someone was able to impersonate. And if everyone here can uh, uh, remember every single service they've used where they've logged in with GitHub, that application could probably impersonate you inside of GitHub and submit a review on your behalf. So. Um, so every time we do a plus one or a view of a, of a particular uh, code change, we have to pull out our phones and, and log it. Or for those people, oh yeah, and um, uh, code flow checks before every deploy, whether that deploy is reviewed. That means that if someone is able to get something onto the master branch, even though it hasn't been reviewed, code flow will be the last line of defense to make sure that that unreviewed code doesn't get into into production, and then we have also built out a bunch of, a bunch of things around that. But uh, so here's an example of someone using uh, Heimdall to review a commit. So you can't review your own commit, which makes sense, just like, and you also can't review your own pull request. But here's Jack trying to review and using his fancy uh, Apple Watch. There you go. It's the only reason why to own an Apple Watch. Um, so uh, get. Um, oh yeah, and Heimdall also posts GIFs because we did that on Friday when no one felt like working. Um, so another thing that CodeFlow does, um, so CodeFlow is, not, is, is a build pipeline, so it also builds all of our Docker containers. And a lot of people base Docker containers on, on publicly hosted Docker containers using tags. A tag can change, which means if someone was able to pwn um, uh, a particular Docker, like a Redis container or something like that, they could then rewrite the, um, the, the Docker container to include a reverse SSH shell or something that sends home. Um, so what do we do? We validate the entire hierarchy. We make sure that everything inside of Docker, um, everything is built using code flow. We validate the shards of those code flows. And then, um, and then after testing, we can promote a particular Docker shard to be the base image and then rebuild all of the containers um, underneath it. Um, I recommend you do this rather than like relying on master or version one or something because those things can change without you knowing. Um, yep. And we also just use um, containers as configuration. So we don't use yeah, Docker as as a security mechanism because CVEs are just always happening. Um, <laughs> that's the security team. Um, so CodeFlow deploys um, CodeFlow. This is another fun thing about CodeFlow. CodeFlow deploys itself. 
Odin deploys itself. Heimdall secures Heimdall. So that's recursion. It's really good for us dogfooding. If when when I can I can go and deploy Codeflow using Codeflow, and my main tool is the tool that I'm building and providing to everyone else in the organization. If it breaks, I'm probably the first to notice. It also means that um, it's faster developing. It means that actually changing the code in Codeflow and then redeploying every time I improve Codeflow, I improve the experience that I have. So that's that's um, really great and and um, incentive for me to do like good work. Um, the cons of recursion, if it fails, if a code flow deploy fails, that means I have to rebootstrap code flow. And that turns out to be a pretty manual task and pretty horrible. But it's kind of worth it because like 99% of my our, failed, uh, our deploys succeed. So that kind of like moves on to like, how do we actually measure success? So um, in code flow, we measure the, the, the number of uh, failed deploys, so the rate of failure. We measure um, the, the scale of our deploys. Um, so we measure that in deploys per engineer. The main reason for that is we want, as as we grow as a company, we have 50 or 60 engineers at the moment. As we grow, we don't want just one or two engineers to be the people that deploy. We want everyone at the company to feel comfortable deploying. We've built a trusted, secure pipeline that we want people to be able to deploy Coinbase on their first day. The measuring deploys per engineer rather than just total deploys means that as we scale as a company, we want that number to stay pretty flat, around like three or uh, between three and six is what it is at the moment. That means that um, we are uh, deploying more services, we're deploying more frequently, and people are comfortable with our tool. Um, we're also limiting rot. So that means that we're calculate, uh, finding projects that haven't been committed recently. That means that their Docker hasn't been upgraded. That means that they haven't been scanned by our security tools like Celis and Claire, which I mentioned before. We want them to go through the pipeline as often as possible so that we can find those CVEs and fix them as quickly as possible. Um, and then we also measure role. Um, so like, like I showed you before, when we deploy, we actually delete the old boxes. That means that right now, the average EC2 instance in Coinbase is under a day old because it's Monday and everyone decided to deploy their services today. So um, that means, but what we want to do is make sure that our oldest box is no older than 30 days. We want to make sure that we are on the latest Docker, we've, we've built on the latest Docker base, we've, um, we're deploying on the latest AMI, we have the latest tools and security scanners and everything in place. So. Um, this kind of like mentality of m reducing the time it takes to deploy services led us to Scorched Earth, which was an event that we had where we rolled our entire infrastructure in under a day. So we built our AMI, we built every single Docker instance, um, we rebuilt every single Docker instance with a newer version. We then um, we then deployed every single application we have, and we also rolled every service that every third-party service. That means that. Um, in Coinbase on that day, we had no instance older than 24 hours. And on top of that, um, uh, we had zero downtime during that event. So the idea is that we can actually, behind the scenes, if a, if a root CVE like Heartbleed or something comes out, we can roll our entire infrastructure in under, in, in under 24 hours without having to worry about it. And the idea is that we're probably going to try this again this year, because why would you not try and prove to yourself that you can be secure? Um, yeah, so what has Coflow actually done for Coinbase? Well, everyone deploys and often. This, um, as, uh, as uh, Luke mentioned, at the bottom left-hand corner, that's us on Heroku. That's the number of deploys that were going out on Heroku, usually done by one or two people because those are the people with the, the permissions, and not very often. As we scale, had more engineers, we get more projects, we get more deploys, we get more, more engineers, we get more projects, we get more deploys. It's going up and to the right, which is exactly the price of Bitcoin is doing. So um, we we want to encourage this. And if you look as well, like the majority of people are others. The majority of people deploying are not like three or four people. They aren't like the tech leads. They aren't the, the, the eng managers. These are the people that are actually building the features and able to test it in production. Um, so just a few more slides, we've got current and future work. So the current work, um, multiple configurations per target. So one of the things that has been a, a strongly requested feature is to be able to deploy basically the same repository with multiple configurations. One example for this would be that one person wants to deploy the web 
workers of a particular Rails app separate from the sidekick back background workers. So that way um, they can have two separate configurations, they can have two separate like like uh, amount of like uh, reviews needed, they can, yeah, they can evolve separately. Uh, so then we have uh, deployable lambdas. So the last infracoders meetup that I, that I came to, uh, a guy talked about his deployable lambdas and then we went and made them. So, um, uh, so this is the steps we took. First, we built a lambda that deploys lambdas, cool. Then we added a lambda deployer to CodeFlow to deploy lambdas. So now CodeFlow can deploy lambdas. And then of course we would deploy the lambda deployer with CodeFlow. So that's bootstrap. So now we can deploy deploy lambdas. So now the lambda deployer deploys itself, just like CodeFlow deploys itself and Odin deploys itself. So now we have a bootstrapped version of the lambda deployer. This includes a bunch of like really nice security features. We encrypt all of our environment variables. We add them into there um, using KMS keys and various other things. We sign things. We, we, we've taken the same security stance with lambdas as we have with our EC2 instances. Um, and then we want to open source CodeFlow. So um, one of the problems is we built CodeFlow for Coinbase. And we, but um, when we started GeoEngineer, we knew we were going to open source it. So I imagine like open sourcing CodeFlow will take a little bit longer, but hopefully by the end of the year. Then you guys can all like laugh at my code. Um, cool, so let's deploy Coinbase. I hope no one else is deploying because you can't deploy twice at the same time. Cool, so I'm now deploying the production version of Coinbase. Let's go back. What did this just do? So this spun up that amount of services. That amount of services is currently running and it's gonna spin up that amount behind like an ELB. These are all workers and pollers and like, like all of the different pieces of infrastructure to actually get CoFlow, uh, Coinbase working, which is 21 instances, seven auto scaling groups and 14 contain or 14 images separated across all of them. Um, it's like 14 times 21 or something, uh, number of like instances running. So what I just did was I, clicked a button and I rolled all of Coinbase. It's, it's like, that's the goal, to be able to like allow people to show up on their first day and do that. Um, thanks to the Infra team, uh, this is us celebrating deployable lambdas. We did that like last week. Um, and uh, are there any questions about Coppola? How fast do you deploy? Like, do you guys do canarying or do you allow specifications around how long it should roll out just in case there's issues with the build? So um, we wait a certain amount of time, it's specified in the AWS config for an ELB to become healthy before we fail to deploy. Also, if we see an instance in a terminating state, we fail to deploy. So, um, or, or the auto scaling group doesn't get enough instances, we fail to deploy. So we're, tr we're, trying, to f we're, we're trying to fail that deploy, basically. Um, of course, we end up with like 90, not 95% like success rate of actually deploying. The, um, we don't do canarying at the moment, we want to. It's a bit difficult under, for various reasons in, in our infrastructure. Um, and as a feature, it's like makes amazing sense just to deploy one or two instances, then then like allow the auto scaling group to expand. Um, and what, what was the, you asked like three questions quickly. I think those were the, the two that I just asked, but oh. I do have more if you're interested in hearing more. <laughs> so, oh, no, you asked how long it takes. So um, it takes about five minutes to deploy Coinbase on a good day. Um, it's about seven minutes on a bad day. Um, it takes like 30, maybe 10 seconds to deploy a Lambda. So we want to be deploying more Lambdas. <laughs> um, we also want to um, build a Lambda that deploys S3 buckets because that takes about five seconds so that we can, if, so if we can separate front end assets from back end assets on a bunch of our services, that means that the deploy time for people like fixing a spelling mistake in HTML goes from seven minutes to five seconds. That's when we start to get to like that uh, continuous integration kind of speed. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll go. Me, go the, yeah. Okay. I'll ask one quickly, maybe on the way. All right, go ahead, go for it. Uh, yeah, so I was just gonna, I was um, wondering, how do you guys handle um, rollbacks? Is that a thing that happens? So if somebody deploys and it's all good and then you discover that everything's not okay, I mean. Oh, you deploy the last 
the previous the deploy. Previous so, so, so we list the deploys so you can quickly find out what the previous good deploy was, and then you can roll back. The idea is that if you make deploying really fast, you don't need to make rollback really fast. So um, as long as like that thing that we're deploying is in code flow, then the then rolling back is really really quick. It's as fast as like anything else. We could speed it up by running like the instances on the side, but again, um, if you've got background instances running on the side, you either turn off their access to whatever queue they're listening to, and then they just sit there erroring, or you um, uh, what is it? Just turn them off and like auto scale down, and then you're just waiting for an auto scale group. So rollback is a um, not a, you don't need rollback if deploys are fast. Is is basically how how we view it. What is the workflow like for the configuration management in CodeFlow? Is it committed something? Can you see the history of changes in there? Uh, what is it like for multiple teammates to like work on the same, like edit this thing? I don't know, maybe it was on there and I just didn't see it. Is this like backed by a Git repo for instance or? No, we can't back it by a Git repo because putting environment variables inside of Git is literally what they tell you not to do. Oh, yeah. So, um, uh, so, oh, that deploy there failed, that's fun. Um, over here, there. So that's the kind of thing. So I changed this to an M4 large. Um, you can look back through the audit history and then see what what has changed. I'm imagining that changing it to an M4 large did something weird with this particular Docker. Yeah. So um, after a deploy, how long does the developer watch the service for? Um, so we have like a real-way synchronous, like, um, culture, we have a lot of alerts and a lot of PDs. Um, so if your deploy failed, you'll get PD'd. But if people are watching the deploy, then they don't trust it. So we try and eliminate and fail as early as possible before something breaks. So what I've noticed when, when I got people deploying 30, 40 times a day is that somebody would deploy, right? There'd be four more deploys in between. And then the bad code caused the database to queue up or slow down to the point where it started to break. And then you don't know which one caused it. And how do you go back? And because five other people have deployed in this time, nobody's watching anything. Um, I see what you're saying. So um, uh, what we recently integrated is the ability to have callbacks on when a deploy goes out. So if, for instance, um, uh, we run bug snag internally, you can tell bug snag when your deploy went out and then give it a particular release ID. So if there's a lot of bugs on a particular deploy, then they will be tagged with that because you told bug snag that right now in production is the running this deploy. Um, we do the same thing with like New Relic and we want to do it um, with a bunch of other services that we run. But those are the, um, uh, by doing that, you can say, hey, look, my, you know, like if you're looking at like your performance metrics, you can have a look. It's like, hey, why is my latency so much higher on this particular deploy? Um, and because you have like, this is where the deploy was and this is where the deploy ended. It's not instantaneous a lot of times. A lot of times we the, don't have instantaneous deploys. I don't no, know no, no, no. Like you deploy and it's not, it's the, like the slowdown isn't instantaneous. Oh, yeah, but when, I don't think we deploy that, that amount. We're not constantly deploying. Okay, you're not so, that much, so... So uh, Coinbase probably had like five or six deploys today. Okay. Um, but across all of our hundreds of like, I think 250 services we, we currently have um, running behind the scenes, that then of, of all of those, we probably had 70 or 80 deploys today. Uh, yep. Um, so you mentioned that you roll um, all of your instances on a, like a 24-hour basis. And if the security team doesn't let you answer this, I understand. Um, do you roll your data volumes along with that, or do you reattach to existing data volumes for, you know, your Cassandra's or MySQL's or any of that kind of stuff? Are you just rolling the, the environment and everything over top? Yeah, so that entire role of the infrastructure does not include some of our data volumes. We're using things like RDS and whatnot, which we can, like, force a roll by, like, by forcing a failover, but that causes 15 seconds of downtime. Mm -hmm. So um, for the actual scorched earth, method, like uh, we were trying to do it with zero downtime, which we succeeded, and like shooting ourselves in the foot by doing something that was essentially unnecessary and could cause customers issues. Um, we, we haven't done that. Um, uh, yeah, other, other than that, yeah, we don't, we try to run stateless services as much as possible, so we try not to but like meddle in those horrible dark arts of, of running clusters and migrating data and all that stuff, but yeah. 
Um, where in the flow does the, like if there, if there are data migrations that need to occur before the service actually goes live, where does that happen in this flow? Uh, pardon, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm saying if there are any uh, data migrations that need to happen before a service gets deployed, where in this flow does that happen? Um, so typically people will deploy a Docker container that dies pretty quickly afterwards, like like migrate the data. And then you just have to, because deploys are reasonably quick, you might like run a deploy that migrates the data and then tries to do it with like no downtime and then run another deploy that then can use the data. But of course, you, you like on this kind of like continuous deploying, like stopping the service, running a migration, starting a service doesn't work. So um, that's typically the, the way in which we've gone about it. Uh, how are we doing for time? Are you able to abort a rollout that you're attempting if you realize that you're rolling out something that's going to clobber someone else's change? Or do you just have to like sit there and watch it like inevitably go out and do something bad? Um, uh, we, we don't have the automatic way of doing it. But like I said, we try and fail. So there's loads of ways in which we can force a failure manually. So um, I think it's, I've been working here like a year and a half. If it's happened like twice, and then I've just got to go in and term an instance while it's deploying. Um, and then, then Odin goes, hey, something's gone wrong. I'm just going to not, not do this anymore. Um, but uh, it is actually a very highly requested feature, that kind of like kill. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think yeah, we should have it. Uh, has there ever been a situation where you're trying to push out an emergency change? And I know you mentioned that you have all these checks and balances in place to make sure that, um, you know, the good code gets out there, um, that you had to kind of just say, all right, go, you know, you got the green light. <laughs> has oh, that, has really that been a situation that that has happened or are you yeah, guys? Yeah, what has happened, sorry. So you need to push out an emergency change that, um, you know, you have all these restrictions in place to make sure that only good code gets out there, right? That you want to be allow anyone to be able to deploy code. So in that emergency change situation, how do you oh, we don't We don't have emergency changes. Okay. I mean, that's like, you know, we don't have emergencies is not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that like the pipeline is the pipeline and it is pretty fast to get stuff in. So hot fixes and whatnot can get in. Like if you need to make a one line change, then it can go through the entire pipeline, build a Docker container, come out the end within like under 20 minutes. But um, working around security mechanisms tends to be bad because that's how a person would come in and then deploy bad things. So um, we, we just don't don't do that. And then uh, getting the latest um, Docker containers, um, like vetting them, um, you know, like the latest Redis Docker container. How do you guys go about? That? Oh, we don't vet. So we build from scratch. You just build from okay, build from scratch. Yeah. So um, our security team maintains like our base containers, so yeah. Um, and then a lot of the application level containers fall on the developers themselves or the infra team. Um, what's the time? Cool. <laughs> uh, definitely, if you have more questions, feel free to just come up to Graham after, but we're gonna kind of wrap things up here. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming out. And thank you, Graham. For this nice talk. <laughs> feel free to hang out. I'm gonna be hanging out. I don't know if you're hanging out that long, Graham, but yeah, we're gonna be hanging out. Feel free to grab some more beers if there's still food. No, I think we packed up the food, but feel free to grab some snacks in there. Just hang out. Um, males, uh, guys' restroom is down the hall on the left. Uh, girls is just through those doors on the right. Um, and yeah, happy to have you. Thanks so much again for coming out. <laughs>